Good morning everyone on behalf of IFL I welcome you all to the post results conference call of Bajaj Auto I also take this opportunity to welcome Mr Kevin Disa President Finance Mr Rakesh Sharma Chief Commercial Officer as well as other members of the management team I request Kevin to make his opening remarks which will be followed by Q&A over to you Kevin Good morning everybody thank you for coming and showing the interest in Bajaj Auto I'm very very happy to welcome Rakesh Sharma who has been elevated to the post of Chief Commercial Officer just two days back Rakesh as you know was handling our export business uh, and we have done wonderfully well over there so we are using Rakesh's service to lead the entire front end so the domestic motorcycles the commercial vehicles the KTM the Bajaj finance uh, auto finance vertical all report into Rakesh Rakesh is a junior a person by the name of Mr Grahapati will take over exports but I am very sure that Rakesh will be leading that still but over and above exports he will be there in this entire front end business part of the strategy working very closely with Rajiv so i am very happy that rakesh is there with us on this call and now over to you for the q and a thank you very much ladies and gentlemen we will now begin the question answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 participants are requested to use handset while asking a question Ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles We take the first question from the line of Ashutosh Tiwari from Equivalent Securities please go ahead Yeah, hello, sir. Uh, sir, volume growth has been pretty strong over last uh, three months uh, uh, across the board. Um, how do you see the demand, especially on the domestic side, two wheeler, three wheeler going ahead? And we have been fairly aggressive uh, in terms of discounts, the price cut in the over last three months. How do you see that continuing going ahead? So let me say this way that on the export side, I will share with you what our target was for the start of the year and where we are. We have started at about one. set a target for ourselves of 1.9 million vehicles uh, first half quarter we have already crossed a 500000 mark second quarter we should be able to repeat very closely so we are on the uh, track to hit a magical 2 uh, million numbers for exports as far as cv goes we had the permits helping us in the past this year in addition to the permits which is got over in the first quarter we are doing very well in the diesel segment we are having a run rate of close to about 100000 per quarter so again we will be hitting our annual target of about 375 to 400000 numbers as far as the domestic motorcycles concerned given the action that we have taken on the m segment where we have corrected the price of the ct and we have introduced the pulsar uh, twin disc at the price of 67 or 1000 rupees we are doing very well over there so we are averaging about 2 lakh numbers every month and therefore again well set on our target of hitting 2.4 million vehicles this is what the target was we set about so year in year i would say that again the whole year we of last year we did 4 million vehicles we should see ourselves doing about 4.8 million vehicles this year so on the on the pulsar front we launched pulsar classic at a lower end right Yeah, the pulsar. Uh, what we are trying as a part of the strategy, what we are doing is making as leaders in the segment would like to expand the segment. So therefore, what we have done is we have introduced the pulsar twin disc at the existing price. We brought the existing pulsar, which I call the standard, down a little bit, and this is with the intention to really get the guys on the M3 segment to look at the pulsar. We have introduced a classic in a very small manner, where I don't believe uh, is going to be the runaway model for us. It's continuing to be the twin disc, and retail sales show the same. So, if in the in the in, in the M segment, computer segment, basically, if we, if we look at, will we still be playing with CD and Platinum only, or and Discover, which probably has not got such a good response as of now, or we'll be looking at launching a new model platform altogether? In the near term, it will be the M segment will primarily be for. Then that should accrue to Bajaj would be closer to 200 crore. Is that right? No, no. Its dividend is uh, what has been declared, and that's 95 crores is what was declared because we have only 48 percent. So whatever KTM declared, it goes to a Netherlands company, and from there comes to us. 
So we keep some amount in the Netherlands company for managing and investments over there. But 95 crores was the Netherlands company of ours, which is a 100% subsidy, declared and accounted for us. And so, like uh, within our uh, hedges, what would be the mix of par forward and range forward? Uh, just trying to understand. But let us say it's about 30% is uh, par. Understood. So, what kind of levels are expected for this year, and to what extent can we benefit? Uh, I'm trying to understand whether the exchange rate realization can be better in Q2 versus Q1, sir. Thanks. I would say the Q2 would definitely better than Q1. And my estimate for the whole year basis, depending on the rupee depreciating, continuing, I think I should be getting somewhere closer to 68 rupees. Uh, and so, like recently, there was a price hike up to one and a half percent, and plus this exchange rate realization should also improve going forward. So, sequentially, is it fair to assume that there will be a better margin improvement? You are talking in terms of the export side? No, sir. Overall business, sir. No, I don't think so, because uh, what I see happening very frankly is that the entry-level segment and the motorcycle business is going to do far superior than the growth in the export and the three-wheelers, because in Q1, you have already seen exports hitting 500,000 numbers. You have already seen 100,000 numbers of three-wheelers. The growth of motorcycles business is going to be higher than the other two business, and within motorcycles, the growth is going to be more in M1 segment. The blended rate will have be a negative impact. Understood, understood, sir. But wouldn't the commodity inflation impact be passed on a bit after the price hikes? We have all passed on the commodity increases for as far as uh, exports is concerned on the three-wheeler side. On the CV business, we have passed on. And in the uh, motorcycles also, we have passed on, barring in the M1 segment. There also, we have passed on with a price increase in July. So to some extent, that benefit will come in quarter two. Understood, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Ashish Nikam from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Kevin. Hi, um, so, hi. So, firstly, on this, you know, new discounting strategy, uh, is it going to be restricted to the CT100 or something we can even follow for other brands? I uh, right now there is no need for any other brand as confirmed. Uh, right now it's only for the CT. And let's say, for example, you have done it in March, started in March, and there's not going to be a further change in April, May. I mean, in July, August, September. Okay. But and I'd like Rakesh any... to say a few words on this topic if, uh, so that he could just share something more than what I am doing. Actually, our um, strategy is born out of uh, acknowledging two forces which we are sensing. One is we feel that uh, uh, this is a moment where uh, there is there can be considerable expansion at the bottom of the pyramid. So it's not really uh, completely a discounting strategy, but it is a sort of an attempt to move into a blue ocean kind of an approach where we are wanting to expand the bottom of the pyramid. And uh, we see that we have very good models with good acceptance, good track record uh, in um, the CT100 uh, uh, brand. And the benefit besides the um, volume is going to be also the energization of the wider dealer network, the service network, uh, the uh, para sales network, etc. So we are looking at this as a very holistic uh, approach rather than a red ocean kind of an uh, approach of uh, just uh, buying some share for from competition. The second force which is um, gone into uh, uh, as an input into our strategy making is that uh, at the same time we are sensing that the consumer is guided carefully, uh, is uh, wanting to, uh, you know, upgrade in terms of uh, vehicle performance and CC. And it is there, if you analyze, you will see that more of 125 CC, more of 150 CC, more of 300 CC, or, uh, we're getting these signs. So the whole Pulsar, Pulsar is a very strong brand, and it's an aspirational brand. And we're just trying to widen its uh, scope a little bit so that those consumers who are wanting to get into a 150cc, uh, the Pulsar brand makes it a little bit more uh, accessible by having the classic Pulsar. We are conscious that this might dilute the Pulsar brand uh, equity a little bit uh, because we are widening its uh, scope. So therefore, uh, as a countermeasure, we have launched the 
twin disc, and it's not just a twin disc, but it sort of takes off from the pulsar 180. So it's a slightly different uh, and more attractive uh, vehicle, which will countermeasure this uh, expansion uh, of the scope of pulsar. And we're already getting some very, very handsome uh, gains uh, from the pulsar uh, twin disc. And um, and then therefore we are continuing up the ladder with uh, pushing and uh, uh, you know uh, pushing pulsar 200 ns the dominar etc which hopefully will benefit from the same uh, up trading force which we are sensing in a segment of the uh, market. Okay. Um, also, you know, so just coming back to the CT. So I mean, right now we are at 33.7 percent in the entry level segment. And you mentioned you want to go towards 45. After we hit that mark, is there some sort of strategy to make money on the CT, or is it at a particular level of volumes, which is currently, I say, 60,000 a month? At a particular level, do it, does CT become EBITDA neutral at some point? Uh, see, what we're looking at is introducing new products also in the M segment. Maybe definitely not in the M1 segment, but in the M3 segment. That may be about nine months away. So in the meantime, this is where we will be playing the CT card and the price strategy. Okay. And just, you know, lastly, is there now a margin level on a overall company level that we don't want to fall below? I, I believe that used to be 20, but is there a new level now? No, no, no. I've always said 20 was a result. 20 was never the target. So it was exports was to get the desired margins, CV the desired margins. Within that, the pulse of the desired margin, 20 was a result. Right now, okay. we are looking at individual margins for individual business verticals, and that remains the strategy of the company. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All the best. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Tanesh Gandhi from Motilal Oswal Securities. Uh, hi, Kevin. Hi, Rakesh. Uh, hi. My question hi, pertains Jimmy, to... Hi, how are you? I'm good, sir. Uh, my question pertains to the commuter deluxe category where we have indicated we'll be launching new products and compete. Uh, like never before. Uh, uh, can you throw some light on strategy on that category and what implications does it have for our margins? Would strategy be similar to uh, M1 segment there as well? Uh, I think here, for example, uh, the V that we had launched in order to give us some the, the results they has not worked out for us. The discover that is relaunch is by and large meetings are requirements, but never not really the numbers. We have looked at actually the entry contributing about 40,000 numbers, which currently is doing about 20,000 numbers. So therefore, there is a shortfall over there of 20,000 numbers. I believe when we look at the M3 segment, it will be more of features rather than a price point that we attract the customer, and that's what we are working on. So some vehicles, some brand, or some, uh, some items will be definitely coming in in the M3 segment, either with a revamped V or with a Discover or something, but that's something with work in progress. And that will unfold probably towards the first quarter of the calendar year, FY19. Uh, no, first quarter of the calendar year, 19, sorry, my mistake. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, so here it won't be a margin negative kind of a scenario? No, no, no. Okay, and uh, alternatively, we're also looking to launch a new brand in M1 segment as well. No. Okay, so the new brand is only in M3. I'm not even saying a new brand. Like I'm saying a new products will come in in the new M3 brand. segment, which could be the, the V that may be done up a better or discover something. But I, but definitely focus on the M3 will come in, but that will be from the first quarter calendar year 19. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. And uh, secondly, uh, with respect to our uh, commercial vehicle business, uh, you indicated that uh, permit-led momentum was witnessed in 1Q and now it should normalize. Uh, would you be still looking at domestic volumes close to about 35, 36,000 or that should trend down towards uh, 28 to 30,000 range given? No, I think uh, we'll be definitely doing the 30,000 plus per month uh, going forward in the next uh, nine months. Okay. Okay. Because we're doing very well in the diesel segment and the cargo segment. Right, right, right. Okay. And lastly, uh, with respect to the tax rate, uh, do we expect tax rate to trend around 31, 32% or uh, it would be close to 29, 30%? No, it will be 31%. So whatever we're seeing the tax rate for the current quarter, that should continue for the whole year. So it will be somewhere in the 31% band because the only benefit right now that we get 
is on the R&D spend, which is at 150%, as against earlier the 200%. So we will be in the 31% band or so. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah. Hello? Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so uh, quickly on, uh, on the export side, sorry, on the forex edges side, uh, this was for the first time after long time that we have entered into par forwards. Uh, this is the new strategy on hedges because we have been very much uh, focused on range forwards. So uh, is, uh, is that this what we continue for FY20 as well? No, this was the, the what we do is we take almost a 12 to 18 month uh, position that we have considered. So the par forward that we are seeing right now is taken about uh, uh, 10 to 12 months back. Right. right now, all that we are taking is going to be continuing to be on the range forward. Okay, okay. So uh, FI 18, I mean, whatever uh, uh, par forwards we had, about 500 odd million dollars, will be exhausted in FI 18, FI 19. Yes, yes. Understood. Okay, great. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Pinay Singh from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Kevin. Hi, Vinay. Uh, uh, my question is basically on the domestic side. You know, we are already at around 16.3% market share, targeting to take it to 20. Uh, already doing around 200k run rate and then 2.4 million annual, which is sort of annualizing to that. So, in the sense, are you implying that if you if you reach your target of 20 percent, then the volume, monthly volume run rate will be much higher than what it is now? No, uh, right now with the monthly run rate, we are doing about 200,000 numbers. But now the festive season comes in, so the numbers will go up. Now, my market share will also depend on how the industry performs and how the other competitors react. But I believe uh, ending the year at a close to a 20% market share is uh, what we would like to see ourselves uh, at that point. Then later on, as you know, we always uh, mentioned that our target one, uh, market share was around 24%. Okay, okay. And this 20% over the next two quarters is predominantly coming from entry-level segment. Is that where and you see the S1, which is the really? pulse segment. Okay, so basically you intend to expand share in both the segments. Right. So even if you look at the segment, oh, there, the Pulsars and Avengers in this quarter grew by 47%, and our market share went up there by 238%. Right, right. And Kevin, you like this strategy, uh, which is uh, partly driven by pricing. How do you see, like, eventually competitors will react, right? So if they do, then nobody really wins in the end. So what is the management's take on that? Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are looking at uh, this market share. We are looking at a 20% market share. We are looking at the two segments to grow. And really, we cannot anticipate or forecast whatever competition is doing. In any case, as far as I see it, uh, the play, place where I'm doing the pricing game is just 14% of my turnover. We are not doing any pricing act strategy at all in terms of exports wherein export is more the distribution, service, and warranties and other such benefits that we're giving to an after-sales service to customer. That's giving us market share. As CV is this pure performance of the products. As far as pulses are concerned, is nowhere a situation of uh, pricing. KTM is nowhere pricing. Spare parts is nowhere pricing. So the pricing activity is basically on 14% of my turnover. Okay, and uh, could you uh, give us your uh, revised margins across businesses? No, that I won't share right now. And uh, spares uh, revenue, domestic and exports? Uh, spares, we did about 650 crores in the quarter, and that was uh, representing a growth of about 8%. First quarter was affected a little bit because of uh, availability since uh, the domestic motorcycles and exports all uh, took off, so there was a bit of a shortage of supplies to the spares division. But that will be made up in the second quarter on going forward. Okay, okay. And just last question, Kevin, any comments on inventory in the domestic motorcycle business? Like, where is your inventory levels now versus March? It is, uh, if you're talking of the CT and the Platina, it will be less than 30 days. But in total, if I look at the entire inventory as a total, it will be about five weeks. Okay, great. A little higher. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Even today, uh, even today, Bene, uh, plant is not yeah. in a position to meet the requirement of the CT. Okay, okay. Great, great, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Amin Pirani from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Kevin. Thanks for the opportunity. 
uh, and welcome to Rakesh. Uh, so my question was on uh, exports. Uh, given that uh, your end, some of your end markets at least have also seen currency depreciation. Uh, have you, uh, you know, uh, given away some of the gains of currency, or is there a thought process of doing that to maintain volumes? See, uh, we are not set uh, by the, uh, you know, uh, trying to use the pricing uh, card to uh, uh, gain the volume in the uh, overseas market. Our response to uh, pricing, our pricing strategy is really in response to uh, competition out there because, you know, unlike in India, most of the international markets are small and uh, we continuously monitor the Chinese and the Japanese and also the Indian players. We have, over our history, uh, over our history, we have an idea of the kind of premium we can command over competition over there. And, uh, uh, they, uh, and then we respond to competition, uh, competitive pricing. So it's less to do with, you know, whether we've got some windfall from the exchange rate or whether there is a uh, uh, raw material pressure. Uh, the key dominant factor is the uh, uh, competition. With the exception, I would say, of a large market like Nigeria, where we have a 50% market share. So uh, like my comment on India entry-level segment, we continuously monitor the demand price elasticity because we play such a big role over there that if yeah. we price the thing correctly, then irrespective of what competition is doing, there is a chance to expand the market. So okay. that's the way we look at pricing overseas. Okay. Okay. And so my, my next question is on uh, the Avenger brand. Obviously, you know, um, you have been you know, trying to drive uh, Pulsar as a bigger brand than it has been in the past. But what is your thought on the Avenger as to what kind of a number you think is, you know, realistically possible for that brand? And is there a, a strategy to, you know, um, uh, push that brand also as you have made Pulsar as a, you know, as, as a marquee brand out there? See, the, uh, Pulsar is no doubt a much larger brand. Yeah. And one of the reasons why it's uh, a larger is also because of its acceptance uh, and its franchise and it's resonant with the kind of uh, things that consumer in that segment uh, uh, accepts. Uh, so Avenger is not, uh, does not have, uh, uh, you know, that kind of a mass franchise available to it. It is, in the end, uh, slightly different from Pulsar because it appeals um, to the uh, more niche type of consumer. I'm not saying it is niche, but let's say compared to a Pulsar, segment, it is definitely niche. Uh, we do about 8,000 uh, Avengers, so it's pretty strong. And uh, our investments in that brand and in the uh, franchise development will continue. But we will be conscious that it is a special type of a customer who opts for it. And okay. also, on the other hand, has got a broader appeal, and that will be managed uh, appropriately uh, in that manner. Okay, this is, this is helpful. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of S. Natraj from Quantum Advisors. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi, morning. So uh, I have two questions. One is, you know, um, for looking two, three years or even longer um, for us as long-term shareholders, these this pricing aggressiveness or, you know, the chase for market share, what are the three messages that you would like to give us, you know, um, instead of losing, you know, time on monthly numbers and quarterly numbers, what what are the key messages over the longer term that we should take? That's one. So the key message is there that we will be looking at, uh, we cannot be, uh, like today, our market share is about 14 or 15 percent in the domestic. I think that is really not there. We would like to be a very strong number two or number one player if it is. We would be comfortable with a domestic market share of about 24-25%. That's one. Secondly, we'll still look at being a total global player in terms of motorcycles. So we will continue to look at a growth in, the, in India as one of the global markets and uh, build on that. Third is we will be looking at, from a profit point of view, we'll be focusing a lot on the higher-end products, and that's why you'll be seeing us actively uh, getting into this S and Super Sport segment with the Triumph, with the 
KTMs and with the Dominas, etc. And the three wheelers will continue to be there. So in terms of top line growth, I don't see any reason why we would be uh, not willing or not uh, sort of able to achieve a 15% CAGR on the top line. We will be looking at the EPS based on the profit uh, that's there. And each business vertical has to perform based on the potential that it has. So in the M1 segment to take care of the thing, I have been a late entrant, if you may say so. I am a weak and therefore to that extent I have bought market share and I will continue buying market share. But in the sports segment, in the premium segment, etc., where I am a leader, where I am a premium product, I will get the premium margins. So the business mix that is there, but there will be certainly a lot of focus on the top line. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, related to that is the, you know, you have 16,000 crores of cash, uh, you know, and that gives you a lot of, you know, wherewithal to fight competition and take where you want to take it. But, you know, some more clarity on Triumph and his square now would be helpful. I know Mr. Raju Bajar talked about, you know, he will give more clarity in the going forward. But, you know, is there something else that you could share uh, besides what he has shared, saying that what is it that you want to do, both domestic and international, with Triumph and his square now? Just so Rakesh, market, no numbers per se, but just in terms of direction. Yeah, so Rakesh, uh, you're ha happy that Rakesh is there because he's heating this project, so he'll be able to share with you something. Uh, actually, you need not look any further than what we have done with uh, the, what the collaboration, the KTM and Bajaj collaboration has done for KTM brand uh, globally and in India. You need not look further than that. That is exactly the model which we are trying to replicate. Of course, the uh, Skorma as a brand and the model portfolio which we will be putting in, and maybe some of you have already seen what is available in the Husqvarna portfolio internationally. We will be working very closely with the Husqvarna design and R&D team to widen that appeal and bring that, let me say, democratize that uh, uh, proposition so it will be able to, we'll be able to offer it to more and more people uh, globally and in India without diluting the brand value. Uh, so it is exactly the path we will travel, which we have done before with KTM, and to that extent, both teams in KTM, Haskwana and Bajaj, very comfortable with this uh, way forward. And, and lastly, the in export ambitions of, you know, 14 to 15% volume growth long term, does that remain as it is? Yes, absolutely. Unless, uh, you know, the, something in the sky falls on us or something like that, having said that. But I think we are looking at a, uh, at a good uh, 12 to 18 month uh, period. Uh, most of our, those markets where we had a good brand channel platform are sort of uh, have stabilized and uh, uh, we are seeing the market growth. We are we're not seeing extreme volatility in the currency. We are used to a little bit, but uh, as you know, in FY16, uh, FY17, there was major volatility in the emerging market currency. We are not seeing that uh, occur. But unless those kind of uh, macroeconomic tragedies befall us, I think we, given our competitive position and given the, let me say, underpenetration of um, uh, motorcycles and three-wheelers in the world, in our type of world, we see uh, handsome growth uh, in the next couple of years. Okay, and lastly, you know, could, for example, the clearance has come, so um, some some um, light on that. And lastly, your CAPEX plans over the long term, given that you have some capacity constraints which may come through, um, including international CAPEX. Thank you. Uh, so as far as the CUT is concerned, permissions have come through, and uh, we have started billing, or we will start billing in the next few days. Uh, technically, Kerala is allowed to even retail it. So the initial plan is to send out 35, 40 vehicles to the, all the dealerships so the registration process can be completed. But I would say that retails in the Northeast and retails in Kerala should commence within the next month. That is one. As far as the CapEx is concerned, in a normal year, we see a CapEx of approximately about 250 crores or to 300 crores is coming in. So the plan for 1819 would be about 3 billion rupees. But as you, you said correctly, with this uh, us now hitting a run rate of about 5 million vehicles, there will be a requirement for capex and building up uh, for the, the capacities. But as you know, most of the capacity is done by the vendors and a very little is done internally. So I would say that 1920 onwards for the next two, three years after that, the capex could be somewhere in the range of 5 billion rupees. Okay. 
and and lastly a feedback if if you know is it possible to you know maybe once in two years or three years have an analyst meet where we can also listen to mr rajiv badaj and other senior member that will be you know grateful and insightful thank you so much and wish you all sure, the best we'll definitely look at that and uh, i will try to arrange something at least there but now with rakesh uh, joining uh, as the chief commercial uh, officer there's a lot of alignment on the front so i think rakesh would be able to do adequate justice for this so i think in uh, addition to me rakesh would help me us out in meeting all of y'all and trying to uh, explain the strategy okay thank you thank you we take the next question from the line of chanal said from multi act please go ahead good morning kevin and rakesh and good morning thanks for, thanks for your comments on the strategy but again as a shareholder i just would like to touch upon one uh, some qu- query there is that in the past you guys have mentioned that look uh, you, you know he suppose hero is strong in the low end commuter segment bajaj is strong in exports and the high end and of course then there, there are the other players and we don't really want to kind of compete there but today and uh, you as you correctly said that oh, you guys are trying to play the pricing game in the 14% of uh, their overall business but i'm just trying to understand that by what we are doing if we don't i mean we gain share but we are not getting uh, you know the, uh, the profitability is a concern there so how do we really benefit there because at some point of time if i'm going to gain the share if i'm not going to it's not going to be profitable then how does that pan out so just some thoughts there yes uh, i would say that uh, my personal call now this is me but this is personal call is that i would say that ideally we would have liked to have concentrated in the m3 and the top end segment that is what we have attempted for the last 2 3 years we did the come in with the v we did come in with the discover we did do it but for various reasons that did not really work out now for a company of our size being a global player and within the country itself having a market share of what was 13 and 14% is something that we cannot accept and therefore i would say that this is more my call may not be md's call is a more a situation on that we have done it by force rather than by choice so at what point of time do you guys relook at this it is uh, hopefully in the next 2 to 3 years time when we will be in a position to build up the portfolio in the mc segment and that's when we will our uh, requirement of being a market player in the m1 segment is no profit my market share if it comes in the m3 segment uh, then definitely i will start withdrawing from the m1 segment a bit but that i believe honestly in my own personal opinion is 2 years away okay so at least for the next 2 years you continue with the strategy at the uh, for gaining market share at the commuter segment that's right okay okay thank you Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Mahesh Pantre from Carveek. Please, please go ahead. Uh, sir, our other income has been quite volatile. Uh, I mean, what should we look at? Our operating profit has been good, growth has been, but uh, no. The, whatever you see right now is going to be uh, the uh, operating, the non-operating income. You mean, right? Yes, sir. The non-operating income, whatever we have declared for this quarter. If you minus the 95 crores that have accounted for the dividend of KTM, it will be plus or minus 5 to 10 percent of this figure going forward for the next four quarters. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Sunil Gupta from UPS Securities. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning, Kevin. Uh, thanks for taking my question. and uh, welcome to rakesh uh, so just a uh, couple of questions initially on the uh, just on the price increase and the raw material cost so do you think the raw material cost pressure is largely done now or do we see still incrementally in q2 also further raw material cost pressure uh, there are for the cost uh, pressures coming in q2 as well primarily because that the uh, suppliers and capacity is not yet built up Now, as you've seen, that the two-wheel industry is doing very well. So you are facing shortages of various items, like say, for example, wheel rims, which are imported. You're feeling you're sure seeing in a simple item like fasteners. So when the capacity is a constraint, the vendors have a opportunity to ask for higher prices. So there is no decline in prices in quarter two. There's a marginal increase. Uh, but my, my question mainly from a commodity standpoint, do we still see some pressure or the commodity commod- standpoint? For me, let us say, for example, in the motorcycle, it is the al- aluminium that is the biggest driver, and for me, my biggest thing in the aluminium is the alloy wheels, and that's where there's a shortage in the country. 
Right. Right. And uh, uh, also, could you share? I mean, what sort of price increases we have taken? So, have we taken any increases on the three wheeler side? Uh, three wheelers, uh, like I said earlier, across all products, whether it's the Pulsar, whether it's the three wheeler, whether it's the export uh, three wheelers, all cost increases have been passed on without the top up margin on that. The exception has been on the motorcycles in export, where the exchange rate difference takes care of the cost increase. And the second is in the M segment, where when we are talking of an aggressive price, it doesn't make sense to take it, uh, take up the prices over there. The second cost increase, which is significant, is the freight cost on outward uh, dispatches of goods. So that's also pretty significant. The diesel price is going down. Okay. So could you quantify this, Kevin? What sort of price increase has been there, uh, roughly? I think on motorcycles to the end customer, it is approximately about 500 to 750 rupees, which right. if you adjust for the GST and uh, this thing will come to about 350 to 400 rupees for the company. As far as the three-wheeler goes, it's in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 rupees. And this price increase was taken, uh, one was taken in April, the second one was May, and the third and final one was taken on, on July 9th. Okay, so is this a, so thousand to thousand five hundred is the cumulative or is the is no, the July ninth? The one which I just now mentioned is the one that is taken up on July ninth. Okay, yeah, that's what I wanted to. Do. Uh, thanks for that. And just in terms of again, uh, uh, my question to Rakesh would be that, uh, I mean, pricing of course is an element, but uh, I mean clearly given that the uh, market share has been weak for a period of time, what are we doing in terms of the channel strategy? How are you looking at dealer profitability? And are, are we doing anything additional other than the just the pricing strategy? Because, I mean, we did launch the CT with an aggressive pricing uh, a couple of years back. It did make a mark, then it declined last year. And then uh, we've again cut the price further. So just, I, I'm not sure if pricing is going to yield results. So just want to understand what's more uh, that you're doing in terms of getting more market share. No, you're absolutely right, and I alluded to it to uh, a previous question that, uh, you know, uh, pricing on its own uh, may not yield much or may uh, yield uh, uh, nothing if it is not accompanied by a uh, commensurate uh, uh, action on the channel side, on the brand side, and engaging with the customer, etc. So we've got a slew of uh, uh, commercial strategies which uh, range from, you know, doing, going more local in terms of uh, brand engagement and, uh, you know, uh, managing the dealers and, of course, also uh, uh, upping our game in the service side. Because using the pricing, uh, the, using the payment which the pricing will give us, we want to take this opportunity to energize the uh, front end. I think that will be the larger benefit from this move. Okay, sir. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Kapil Singh from Namura. Please go ahead. Yeah, I get it. Uh, so I just wanted to check um, on the segment-wise profitability, apart from the uh, domestic uh, entry segment, has there been an impact or uh, this um, uh, margin decline that we have seen in 1Q is largely because of the mix change? It's largely because of the mix change, uh, Kapil, and also on account of the fact that the cost increase that is taking place was on 1st of April, but the price increase has been taken in phases. Secondly, whenever we talk of a price increase covering cost, we don't add the profit margin on that. Okay. So, so, so by and large, by and large yeah. Kapil, export profitability across all segments remain the same. Mm -hmm. TV remains the same, and the premium remains the same. But again, but there's when a lag between your price hikes. Uh, is that the right way to? Now, again, when you talk of exports, as you know, in the exports, the growth has come from Nigeria. Right. Then my margins of the boxer may not be as high as what I'm getting in premium uh, of the pulsar, which is sold in Latin America. Right. So to that extent, the blended export margins will come off a little bit because of the mix change over there. Okay. So the fact that you have passed on pricing with a bit of a lag should lead to uh, some margin improvement, right, going ahead? It will all depend on margin improvement across each business circles and sentiments, yes. But like I right. said, 
my growth is going to come from the M1 segment, then it's going to have a negative impact. Yeah, but if I see the overall volumes, you know, we are already at that 2 lakh per month kind of run rate. And right. if we are expecting it to remain same for on an average for the rest of the year, then the mix I shouldn't expect, change too I'm much. I'm looking forward to the festive season where the M1 may really go up. And now, for example, the M1 segment, in my view, is going to go the fastest in the industry given the fact of the rural income uh, going up, the MSP prices, etc. So the segment that is going to go the fastest is the M1 segment. And if you look at the statistics, the segment, the industry has grown by 19%, whereas the M2 segment, as a spender territory segment, has grown only by 9%. Got it. Got it. So the segment is also going to be the M1 in the sports. Got it. Uh, so you also mentioned that you are looking at uh, somewhere in teens kind of growth rate in top line. What kind of growth should we expect in EBITDA or uh, bottom line in medium term? You should. Are you looking at a double digit growth over there as well? So, uh, Kapil, really I'm telling you that top line growth I can really confirm to you because that's what I see it happening in the near term. But as far as the EBITDA and the thing, we have not made any projections. So the question was more in terms of the other person who was asking on the long term vision of the next three to four years. Okay, okay. And uh, lastly, on uh, any anything more you would like to share on electric vehicles? Because in the AGM there were some comments. So, uh, any comments on that? We are definitely looking at electric mobility quite seriously, but also cautiously. It's not that we are plunging headlong into it, but we are. We have some very serious product development underway, which spans, uh, you know, from three wheeler, from a quadricycle uh, to motorcycle as well. So uh, we have also got some uh, engagement going on with KTM. So it's not just. Uh, you know, at a, for a commercial use, but also looking at exploiting e-mobility um, uh, on some premium brands. And uh, But uh, it's not that it's going to, because so many things have to fall in place in the external environment, uh, from battery charging, ecosystems, to disposal of batteries, the government stance to it, etc. So uh, we will be taking some... Uh, let me say, small steps forward, but in a broad spectrum in this area. Okay, okay. And I also wanted to check, uh, you know, whether uh, this segment, will it be profitable whenever, uh, you know, whenever you do the launches or should we expect some impact on profitability? Second, uh, the CapEx number includes the investments we are doing on this? Yeah, so when I talk of investment, basically uh, on the electric vehicles, it's because more the manpower cost, etc. cetera, is taking place in the time and effort of the R&D people on that job. And investment would really come in through terms of Bosch, etc., where it could be recovered through component pricing. Okay. okay. So it not be coming directly in our CapEx. Okay. Okay. Okay, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Pramod Amte from CGSCMB, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is with regard to the uh, MD statement in the AGM, where the talk was about the margins to be under pressure for next couple of years at least. Uh, is it predominantly driven by the discounting strategy which you're following and will continue for a couple of years or something? So more? what MD has spoken about the AGM was in a little bit of uh, talk to the shareholders in terms of saying what he can expect from this company, where this company is, MD said, is going to go for a healthy top line growth. It has, it's been traditionally taking risks in terms of the KTM venture, in terms of the Qt, in terms of solar, in terms of electric vehicles, and that's what the company is committed to. And therefore, what he told the shareholders, and what I have repeated in some way or the other, is that going forward for the next two to three years, we will be looking at uh, a very healthy top line growth, increase in sales, and we'll be focusing on M1 segment, where for many of you who are not present over there, MD said that there is, you know, M1 segment right now is about 34%. He would like to see it at about 50%, for which he said that the period of growth is going to be the next two to three years. And therefore, he said in the next two to three years, you would not be seeing the margins uh, being at the 20% mark. Also, he mentioned that in the next uh, 
few quarters, new products will be introduced in the F3 segment, which will to that extent compensate uh, the growth uh, in the M1 segment with a very profitable growth in the M3 segment. Thanks for that detailed answer. Second, uh, looking back at your own experience of last 10, 15 years, uh, either a price war by you or even like Honda uh, hasn't changed the market share drastically uh, in that sense. Why you feel it will work now uh, or in the coming quarters? No, but like I explained to you, you see, the, by me dropping the price on the M1 and the CT, has not affected Hero Honda's numbers at all, uh, Hero Motors' numbers at all. I have expanded the market. It is the second hand buyer who has come in. Look at HF numbers. What is the CT prior and Platina working on? Is the direct competition is HF. But HF numbers have not changed ever since I have uh, topped the price. But the market is expanding. I mean, the That's ultimate not, result is to, for you to gain market share. Am I right? Uh, correct. By expanding the, the market. Same way in the Pulsar, I'm a premium product, I'm a S1, I'll leverage that to expand the market. Okay. And third, with regard to three-wheelers, uh, you have done an amazing job uh, by getting into diesel uh, and uh, basically getting a market share there, significant market share. But uh, looking in the context that uh, the diesel three-wheelers are facing challenges in terms of registration in many of the cities, uh, how do you see this product having the life cycle uh, might be so let me put uh, it two years, two years. Two brands now. So let us not talk of petrol, auto and fuel and uh, diesel. We have got okay. two brands now. One is the RE, which is for the small compact vehicle, which is on fuel diesel. And the other is the Maxima brand, which is the diesel and the large carriers. Now with the diesel going into the CNG and LPG route, the Maxima brand is actually overtaking Piaggio in the passenger segment. So for me, it's not just diesel. I'm talking the Maxima brand, which is also moving to auto and fuel. But you also had the RE on the CNG side earlier. So it's that a, continues. RE is a small brand. So even we had the compact diesel. Right. So the compact is now uh, put under the RE brand. So RE means small, maximize the large. Okay. And how do you see BS4 uh, challenge, which the LCVs are facing? Do you see an advantage for three-wheeler diesel and hence this strategy can play out better for you? So this is a more technical question which I think I'll have to do a lot more studies on that to give you a factual answer. So we can take it offline. Sure. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Chirag Jain from SBI Cap Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, just uh, wanted to check, are we also acknowledging the fact that uh, motorcycle penetration, especially in the entry-level segment, is fairly high, and therefore uh, market expansion uh, can be done only with uh, big price cuts, something what we have done with City 100? Uh, any no, thoughts I, on that? I don't think that was the answer. The weather, I don't think that we trend for market expansion where penetration is high. Uh, and I also say feel that when we launch the price, I think that these results, Relatively, uh, I would call it as surprising to us because we saw the market expanding and we are attributing it to the new guys who are coming in from the second-hand market. Okay. And just a clarification on competitors reacting to the price curves. If I recall a uh, recall, couple of months back, our MD made a statement that we have done the price curves in response to competition. I mean, this is a media interview. So has uh, competition already reacted or have they cut any prices? Uh, in response I think when to you talk of reaction and whatever MD is mentioned about reaction is uh, you shouldn't look at it from a price cut, it's from schemes. You know, most of the guys will come in with insurance offs and schemes, etc., which is what we see happening. And that's why uh, while we have done these three months of the CT price correction, we have seen a very normal reaction from the competition in terms of insurance off, etc., which is a standard uh, reaction. I don't think any person is going to come in with the actual price cut per se is my personal call. Okay. And just final thing, your thoughts on the scooter versus motorcycle shift uh, last three months, uh, there has been a dip uh, in terms of in terms of the scooter share, uh, the shift, uh, what we have been seeing over the last several years. I understand you are not present in scooters, but probably your thoughts, is this a more temporary or you think it's uh, something that uh, would remain for some time? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. And it's absolutely a guess. So it uh, came out as a surprise also that the scooter is uh, motorcycle goes higher. But to one way I would look at it, that the motorcycle growth over the last three years was really suppressed, which is almost flat of margin growth. And with rural income and rural uh, things improving over there, 
maybe that's where the motorcycle is uh, growing faster. But I don't know. Tomorrow it may have been turned on the scooter will also start growing in the or higher than the motorcycle. So is anybody's guess too early to take a call just with three months data? Okay, okay. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Priya Ranchan from Antique Stock. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Just to broad one question on the industry, uh, domestic two-wheeler industry. So uh, are we seeing some kind of down trading as well as some upgrading both have sa are happening simultaneously? Because when we are talking about 19% growth in, one, in M1 and just 9% growth in M2, so ideally, if some uptrading might be happening, then it should also translate from M1 to M2. But what we are seeing is M1 is growing, M3 is growing, I mean, in a fast, faster way, but M2 is slightly weaker in, them, in that sense. So that's a good question and uh, actually proves the strategy that MD and Rakesh and Eric had uh, given in December 2016 when we had a meeting in Akuti, where we said the entire strategy of the company would be to actually avoid the M2 segment shrink the M2 segment by focusing on the M1 and focusing on the M3. And that's what the company did with the M3 coming in with a V and the M1 we had launched the CT and the Platina. And this is exactly what we are gaming for because we believe that the M2 segment should really not exist. Given the value proposition that the Platina gets, why should a person pay five, 6,000 rupees more for a Splendor? Or even, for example, why Splendor? Let's look at HF. HF is the same vehicle that the Splendor is. So the people are paying it and that's what exactly what's happening where people are moving either to the 125cc with the Glamour or they're moving down to the HF or to Bajaj because of the uh, value proposition. That's what is our drive and that's what's a part of our strategy. And as far as the M1 segment is concerned, our strategy has worked out. Yes, we have got to do a little bit more in the M3 segment because we did not come up to expectations. And just one I'm related to that, I mean... Uh, uh, we have seen uh, M3 expanding the market. The expansion of M3 has been quite significant in the last three, four years. So, I mean, uh, are we see some kind of trading from the existing or the old customer of M M3? I mean, with 125 sign moving towards Pulsar and all, which is what our strategy has been in the last few months. And so. We are very clearly seeing that. So, whenever a customer is buying it, he is always moving to the 100 to going to the 125 CC space and then also to the 150. So, that's really happening. But someone who's on the borderline at the lower end with the financing being a bit of an issue, he feels that the existing platina or the HF is giving as much value as the spender and therefore moving down uh, the value chain. And just one housekeeping question on the, what was the export uh, spare parts revenue? Export spare parts revenue was about 190 crores. Okay, thanks. That's all. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Anubhav Bajpai from Goldman Sachs, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, this is Pramod. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity and congratulations to Rakesh. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my first question pertains to uh, uh, the, the impact of all these price cuts uh, uh, on the residual value of the bike because just uh, we need to be also cognizant of the customers who bought these bikes before the discounts and your 10% or whatever price cut has a direct bearing on their residual value. And if my understanding is right, residual value does have an impact on the economic segment customers because they're first-time buyers prominently. They're putting in a favor of their life or annual savings into this uh, asset. So how do you think about uh, uh, the fact that 1.5 million CT100 customers were there after the relaunch all the way till ending FI18? And they probably will have to live with a much lower price. And this is not the first time we have seen with uh, uh, economic segment brands. We have seen that with Pradina earlier. We have seen this with some other brands as well. So don't you think this end of the day has a huge bearing on the residual value as in the brand perception with existing customers? And Because we, as we have seen longer term, it hasn't helped anyone. The price cuts have actually not led to any meaningful market share gain for either us or a competitor. So how do you rationalize this, uh, you know, uh, this bit on the residual impact? Because... Because this, just to remind you, CT100 was a deep discounted brand, and then you had another price drop. So within a matter of 12 months, we have had two deep pricing actions on CT100. So I would say that we have applied our mind too much to this uh, second-hand price, etc., when taking our strategy decision for the future. Okay, uh, but uh, do you agree that residual value does matter to the customer in this category? I 100% mean, I agree that the second-hand price for competition vehicles and our vehicles will definitely come off a bit with the CT being offered at 32,000. There's no doubt about that. 
and is not restricted to Bajaj, it is restricted to uh, the competition as well. But uh, Kevin, I understand that, but uh, to be honest, so, then we are trying I'm to position... I am a frank answer that we have not considered and not taken into consideration anything of the past vehicles sold when planning our future. Yeah, but uh, related to that, because we are trying to position ourselves as a global motorcycle brand with a skew towards premium uh, positioning within Indian market. So how does that have an impact? Because I'm, at one end, I'm de doing deep discounts. I'm, uh, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are honest about being it being a loss-making proposition. Uh, and at the same time, we are trying to up our premium quotient. So this at a strategy level seems to be at a bit odd. Unless we say that the customer who considers a Pulsar doesn't actually bother about looking at a customer of CT100, uh, which is fairly discounted. Because generally in other brand-facing discretionary uh, uh, segments, we we have seen companies being far more conscious about how they position themselves when they have a, a wide range of products and all that. So uh, I'm just trying to understand this as to, uh, is it more of a near-term measure which we have taken to stem the arrest of, or arrest the market share decline and some bit of a dealer, the dealer uh, exits, or is it really, you think this can really settle a lot of uh, longer-term problems for you? Uh, as we have been explaining, and uh, I think to several questions uh, Kevin has responded, saying that this is uh, uh, a medium-term strategy. You know, it is not a knee-jerk reaction to anything. We don't have any reason to have a knee-jerk reaction. Just in this uh, last one hour itself, probably three or four times, we have said that we are looking at this strategy for a period of two to three years. I mean, when we have formulated that stra this strategy, our horizon is two to three years. Now, events may overtake us, which may require us to extend or restrict. That's a separate matter. But as and when the strategy is being formulated, we have looked at a medium-term horizon. So I think uh, you should take that point on board. The second thing is, that the uh, market consi uh, con consists of different types of segments. It's not that you can have one, you know, uh, position which uh, spans the globe and which spans across all the uh, consumer segments. The advantage that Bajaj possesses that it has the versatility uh, of and a diversity of the portfolio, which spans from selling a KTM in Japan to selling a CT100 in the hinterlands of uh, India and selling boxers in, uh, you know, deep Africa. We're selling pulsers in competitive markets like uh, Latin America where we compete with Yamaha and uh, Honda. So, uh, you know, uh, our strategy is being built on this Strength. And we regard this as a big strength. Now, this is not just a front-end strength that you've got a, you know, presence across segments and across geographies. To be able to have a successful presence means that you need a certain kind of manufacturing agility. It means you need a certain kind of R&D uh, knowledge. It means you need a certain kind of a marketing and sales knowledge. All these combined to enable us to have that versatility. And we're playing on that strength. And what we're doing is that we are attacking the a lower segment with a price with at least more than 50% of our ambition coming from expanding the market, like we've been saying, create a larger base. Uh, we are playing on a brand which is very, which has been very, very popular at uh, the lower end. So we expand the market. In the middle segment, it's a more medium-term strategy because we want to differentiate that medium uh, middle segment through uh, uh, products which are very, very, you know, where we want to create some discontinuity that takes time, that, you know, you experiment with things like V, and there'll be a new avatar of V, and there'll be other uh, models, which hopefully will present a very differentiated portfolio. And at the sort of a higher end, uh, continue to, you know, drive the pulsers. So it's, you know, horses for courses. It's not uh, one sweep of the brush. Fair enough, sir. Uh, the second question related to this is, uh, as we transition into BS6, uh, the cost of compliance will hit most of the categories in more or less similar terms, at least when it comes to fuel injection. So how should one look at this segment? Because given the fact that you said it's probably going to be a two, three-year strategy, 
So uh, does it only mean that uh, the uh, under recovery on this particular brand will only increase because uh, after having dropped prices so dr drastically, uh, to expect the customer to kind of again fork out double digit plus kind of a cost inflation? Uh, or I'm just trying to understand how does one look at the profitability of this category as you go into BSX? It will be the same as uh, today. Uh, whenever you're talking about cost increase that's taking place, whether on account of uh, regulatory norms, it will be there for the entire industry. No? Yeah, so you don't expect that uh, the competition will probably kind of absorb the cost and then probably try to play the market share uh, uh, lever. I cannot speak for competition. Uh, but from, uh, from Bajaj's perspective, you find that at least you'll pass through the cost, basically. Yes. Again, no, please that's... understand, as Rakesh has mentioned, you're not operating in isolation. So when you talk of Africa, if, for example, there's something that happened by the Chinese, if there's something that's done by the Chinese, mm -hmm. you cannot sit down and say that I told the analyst I'm going to earn a 20% profit and therefore I will not do it. I will react to the situation as it uh, pans out. Fair enough, fair enough, Kevin. And last question on three wheelers, Kevin. If you can just help us understand how much of your domestic sales is currently exposed to diesel and cargo? Uh, cargo, we do about 3,000 numbers, which are all diesel. Okay, and uh, the diesel passenger, is there, uh, that would be diesel separate, passengers right? Passengers would be approximately about 15,000 numbers. 15,000, oh, that's a fairly big number now. Yes. Thanks a lot, uh, Kevin, and uh, uh, wish you all the best, and uh, hopefully uh, we will uh, kind of gain the desired results what we are looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. Thank you so much. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Arpit Kapoor from IDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Arpit Kapoor, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead with your question. As there's no response from the current participant. Uh, can we take the last three questions now, please? Sure, sir. We take the next question from the line of Rohit Gandhi from PPFAS Mutual Fund. Please go. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Rohit, can you yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to understand a little more on the cute. Uh, what would be the strategy going forward? Uh, are you looking at it as a replacement to the three wheelers or, the, uh, or an addition? Like, uh, what is the exact strategy? As of now, I think it is more uh, making sure that if and when a uh, transition takes place, uh, we are well prepared for that transition. Uh, the cute also offers immense opportunity to make it into an electric vehicle. Uh, right now, we are looking at it more from an addition to the existing uh, three-wheelers. For example, the opportunity is huge if at all South Mumbai opens up for the queue. So right now, we are looking at it as a complementary rather than a substitute for the three-wheeler. Okay, and any uh, capacity expansion for the queue would be required right in the now, near term? capacity for 60,000 queues, and that should be good enough in the near term. Again, Capacities are fungible, so between three-wheelers and four-wheelers, we can always use the capacity. So if the overall capacity, there's a bit of a switch between three-wheeler to four-wheeler or vice versa, that can be managed. Okay, thank you so much, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. We take the next question from the line of Kaushal Maru from TSP Blackrock. Please go ahead. Hi, Kevin. Uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, we've enough discussed on pricing, but can you also talk about what other initiatives on the marketing side and on the advertising uh, side are you going to do for gaining the desired market share? We're hearing about some insurance uh, schemes, some subventions yeah. coming, etc. Say, for example, at the pricing side, we will not do anything further because this seems to be, it will be a more of a common type of situation. We really okay. do a lot in terms of below-the-line activities, as you have seen, that we have started a hat-trick scheme that is... Uh, been offered uh, for this month of July, where we are offering uh, insurance off. We are offering uh, uh, two years warrior free service, which will be done by the dealers, and also the five-year warranty that we have extended. What we'd like to do, very frankly, is leverage auto finance and the other financing to make the vehicles extremely affordable and within the reach of the customers. So focus will be definitely on product and technology and better products, and then also make it easier for the customer to buy. At the same time, I would also say that uh, as many of you would have uh, known, etc., in the last year with our sales being a market share being about 13, 13.5%, the dealers were a little bit of concern and the enthusiasm level was a little low. What we have seen is with the three wheelers last year, permits came in, we did record numbers, the rub off effect on the diesel vehicles has been immense, and therefore we are also seeing right now with the drop in the CT prices, 
when traffic in the showroom is going up dealers morale has gone up significantly and many of them are willing to spend a lot more money in um, brand building etc combination okay. of all this is something that will give us the desired results so it's going to be products it's going to be quality the service levels a lot of focus is being paid on service rakesh is one of the main topics of rakesh uh, which he has shared with me is to increase and build up on the dealer fraternity and i think all in all with rakesh coming in this is going to be a big step in uh, achieving our desired numbers and so in terms of you know pure advertising in media and uh, in in the media you know we have been uh, typically lower than what our competition has been doing is that something which uh, you think we should be stepping up now i don't think uh, that's true because you look in the last two years we have stepped up significantly and probably what is not been seen by a lot of people is the digital space where we are present for example if you look at the pulsar ads that are come in the ktm etc we are huge in the digital space and that's where we'll actually build up okay okay right kevin thank you and all the best thank you thank you we take the next question from the line of richit mehta from sbi mutual fund please sure sir. from sdm to meeting shortly yeah hi uh just a couple of questions uh, back on that pricing strategy itself uh one you said that you will not operate in isolation with competition etc but let's say for hf also if let's say when bs6 kicks in and let's assume the cost is whatever 4 5000 bucks or whatever that number is and he really says that they will only take half the price hike necessary and pass on some benefits to the consumer does that mean that your current losses would actually expand because you would have to be competitive and therefore only pass on half the cost to the consumer it's hypothetical very hypothetical and i won't like to answer that question okay the second is the it you said that you have individual level uh, margin uh, assumptions or expectations in, in product line segment wise uh, that's so but at a company level you wouldn't have any expectations of this is the bare minimum at a company level margin that we'd like to keep not at all not at all okay thanks thank you well that seems to be the last question I would now like to hand the floor over to Mr. Joseph George for his closing comments. Uh thank you Janice. Uh on behalf of IFL I thank the management of Bajaj Auto for taking out time for this call. I also thank everyone for dialing in. Have a good day. Uh Kevin would you have any closing comment? Uh, just thank you all once again. And uh like I said Rakesh is available once in a while to meet uh, many of you all. So we'll try and make this uh, as a part so that Rakesh will join me whenever we can to address your queries on the marketing aspect as well as the finance aspect. Thank you, everybody.